Hello, I'm Douglas T. Stewart, and we're going to be watching a little chat today with two really creative and interesting guys. First of all, we've got Douglas McIntyre. Now, Douglas is primarily a musician, and he's played with so many people, too many people to mention, but I'm going to mention a few of them. Article 58, which was his first band, which are featured in this book, and we talk a little bit about. He also plays with Vic Goddard, another person we're going to be talking about quite a lot in the chat. He plays with Port Sulphur, The Sexual Objects, The Secret Goldfish, and he runs great concerts in Straven. Straven's his hometown where he started making music. He runs the Frets concerts there, and they're really great, really great shows. And he's ran the label Creeping Bent for 28 years. So he's a guy who's done an awful lot of things, very interesting person, and he's joined by me, of course, and Grant McPhee. Grant McPhee's a filmmaker. He's made two excellent films uh, about the Scottish alternative music scene. He's made Teeny Superstars, which I'm in, and Big Gold Dream. And Big Gold Dream is the inspiration, pretty much, for this book. This is a book that they've written together. It's called Hungry Beat, and it's an excellent study of the alternative Scottish music scene between about 1977, 1984, Got lots of people you'll probably have heard of and possibly a few you haven't heard about. Um, Grant also he works in quite a lot of mainstream films. He's worked on things like World War Z, Under the Skin, he's worked on Outlander, and um, he makes his own fictional films as well. But mostly we're talking about the kind of bands and the music in this book. But we touch on a few other things as well. So I hope you enjoy the chat. So yeah, Douglas and Grant, um, Thanks for coming along and doing this today. I'm going to start with a possibly obvious first question. How did this collaboration come about? Because I didn't really know that you guys, I knew both of you individually, but I didn't know you guys knew each other and there was a kind of crossover. So, and then well, I was slightly surprised when okay, well, co collaboration happened. I met Grant when he was making the Big Gold Dream film which was obviously about fast product and postcard. And uh, that's how we met each other. And uh, yeah, and I guess thereafter we decided to do the book, but it all stemmed from the film, really. You know, in fact, obviously the book stemmed from the film. Mm -hmm. And your background primarily, I mean, you did, you've done a range, you ran a label for close to 30 years, you put on these frets concerts in mm -hmm. Straven, but primarily <laughs> you're a musician. Mm -hmm. And you were a musician in the era that this book was 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 set. Mm -hmm. at. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what your experience was as a musician and what your band were, were how they fitted into that. Okay. Well, um, during the period of I guess Fast Product and Postcard Records, I was in my first band were Article Fifty Eight. We did a single with uh, which was produced by Alan Horn and Malcolm Ross from Postcard, and uh, we released the single on a uh, Joseph K. Manager Alan Campbell's label, Rational Records. So, but we were always gauche rural outsiders. You know, we were a wee bit younger than the bands, so and we were massive fans. You know, massive mm -hmm. fans of the Scars and Joseph K. in particular. So. You um, guys were from Lanarkshire, so you were a bit out. Oh well, yeah, we were. Say. Yeah, we were from from Straven, really, and outside Straven, tiny wee village called Glassford. We used to rehearse in a chicken hut in <laughs> Glassford, my friend's farm, uh, and our singer was from Hamilton. He was metropolitan, and uh, so yeah, we used to go and see all the all the the bands playing. So it was very exciting because you know it was a great time to be that age because we could go through to Valentino's in Edinburgh or uh, with an older friend who could drive so we went through to the bungalow bar in Paisley quite a lot and uh, yeah it was just it was great to be a fan at that time and being in a band was probably an extension of being a fan to be brutally honest <laughs> talking about an extension of being a fan I first met you Grant when we were working on a film project we were both involved right. in um, a film called Viglia. It's a heartwarming Christmas tale, and um, I think we both connected through through music at that point. So, um, and then I discovered you'd these projects going on. Um, 
about Scottish music. First of all, Big Old Dream documentary, which I think is quite related to this book. And one of the things when I saw Big Gold Dream that I thought was interesting, I don't know if this was deliberate for this book or for that film, it felt like there was a perceived narrative about Scottish alternative music at that time, which was pretty much almost like it was all about postcard records and a few bands that were very connected to that. And it felt like Big Gold Dream was almost going, eh, wait a minute. Yeah, those were important, but there was an awful lot of other things that were really interesting and exciting that weren't part of that narrative, postcard narrative, or, or if there were, like yourselves, the connection <clears throat> the connection was um, sort of like a parallel mm. thing. It wasn't, you, were, you weren't you were actually in mm-hmm. the family mm-hmm. of postcard bands. Was, was that a thing that you were trying to do with Big Gold Dream and with the book that present a slightly different narrative than the one that's considered sometimes to be postcard was the only game in town it is something that came together really from doing the film as you said the perceived narrative was postcard being the alternative label from scotland and you know hands up when i came up with a idea for making Big Gold Dream, I'd watched a film made in Sheffield, which was about Sheffield's post-punk scene, which was like a fantastic film. And I thought, well, why don't do something like that with, you know, postcard records? Um, for people who don't know postcard records, quite a short lab- label. Yeah, two they years. made um, some very important key singles by, I guess, bands that were pretty important, like Orange Juice and Joseph K, Australian band, The Go-Betweens, Aztec camera and people like the bluebells were sort of almost yeah. slated to be on the label later and it was ran by quite a an eccentric flamboyant figure it almost seemed to be a bit like a 1980s Scottish Andy Warhol or how yeah absolutely you know I suppose you know impresario like in Alan Horn. sort of like Alan Horn yeah and sort of like grand tradition of people like Andrew Oldham and um, you know, it was almost going to be a documentary and postcard records, and you know, I knew at that time of obviously like Orange Juice and Joseph K, and I met somebody called Manny who was in a band called Win, and I had no idea really what it sounded like and what their story was, and Manny put me in touch with Malcolm Ross who was the guitarist and Joseph K and latterly Orange Juice and you know, we had a meeting and you know it was like it was fascinating because Malcolm started telling me about these bands like from Edinburgh like the Scars I'd never heard of the Scars and yeah you know, this was just before you could really sort of use the internet to look things up and um, you know I was already intrigued but what I found more intriguing was that he said that the Scars were on a record label called Fast Product, and you know, my, you know, one of the first like independent loves that I had was like New Order and Joy Division. So yeah, you know, I, I knew quite a bit about those bands, and I knew that they had a twelve inch on Fast Product, which wasn't on Factory Records, and yeah, you know, I just assumed Fast Product were a record label from Manchester or somewhere in the north of England. So when Malcolm started telling me that this was like from Edinburgh, like mm. where we were, you know, just sort of maybe a mile away from where we met up, it was like my mind was like, what? How, how can this possibly be that this record label from Edinburgh put out a Joy, a joy Division single and they put out other stuff into like the Human League yeah. and Gang of Four? And I thought, hold on a second, there's like something that's slightly... A miss, and the, the more I started speaking to people, you know, the more this other story came out, and you know, it was you know fascinating for me because you know, Joy Division obviously were like a huge band in independent terms, and I couldn't understand why Fast Product just seemed to be, you know, maybe not a footnote, but it was only mentioned in you know passing and a lot of like music. Books and I thought, right, let's get to the bottom you of think this. About a band like the Human League. The Human League are a band that, well, they have one song. I mean, they have other songs that are massive hits, but they've got one song that it feels like one of those songs everybody in the world yeah. would know. But 
again, it seems kind of strange, but the, the label who sort of were maybe the first to sort of really champion their music and released the single Being Boiled um, would would not be really thought about apart from people who are maybe like music and racks or were the right age at that time to be buying these records from like independent record shops. No, absolutely. And, you know, obviously the Human League, you know, certainly Mark One Human League for being boiled, we're not from Scotland. But, you know, the other thing that, it was just blowing my mind was discovering that you know it wasn't just like a one-off single they did or with uh, Dignity of Labour like 12 inch and then they were signed to like a major label it was everything was managed from Edinburgh and the pe- person that wrote Don't You Want Me was you know, from Edinburgh yeah. um, it was yeah, just like what? Yeah. yeah and so you know he sort of, I think he was he grew he was born in North England, but um, you know, he grew up in Fife, where I came from. He, I think he went to to Lucas when he was seven. His dad was in the Air Force, and it was just like, hold on a second, you know, why is this not, you know, not exactly front page news? But mm-hmm. um, why is nobody talking about this story? And I was thinking, well, you know, if I'm interested in this, you know, there might be a few other people who might be interested in this as well. Um, it, was, it was fascinating, and. It's funny because it strikes me in a way that some people could almost see Bob Last, who is the guy behind Fast Product, in a way as also being almost like the East Coast eh, of Scotland, kind of Andy Warhol type figure. And I'm not saying either of Alan Horn with Postcard or Bob Last really were like, but it almost felt like they, to a certain extent, had modelled themselves on some sort of kind of factory, kind of impresario, a slightly mysterious uh, kind of characters. How important were those figures um, compared to the actual people making the records? Were they just as important? Were, did they have as big a, a part in actually creating I mean, I think magic? Douglas will have, you know, you know far more to say on this, but, you know, I, I think the impresarios are like fascinating to me. I've always been like a huge fan. I mentioned them before of Andrew Legoldum, the Rolling Stones manager, and I think he's really one of the sort of like blueprints like for all these independent label impresarios. You know, when you see photos of the Rolling Stones, you know, he was their manager and he owned an independent record label. You know, he's always like photographed and with the bands and like the notes, liner notes and the records are like written by him in a very sort of flamboyant style. And I think he was really somebody who shook up the record industry and, you know, flicked the Vs to all these sort of like old tatted suits and, you know, the 60s, you know, music industry was very much, you know, it was like, it was like, you know, the establishment, you know, people with suits and ties. And I think that these independent impresarios were just really the next in line who took it one step further by doing everything independently. Yeah. And, you know, I think Douglas mm-hmm. will be able to, you know, Douglas knew them both. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there was um, the Andrew Lee Goldham comparison is really accurate I think yeah I think that's a better one than my Andy Warhol one well yeah. I think it's all uh, they're all they all feed into it I also think uh, particularly probably with Alan Horn like Bernard Rhodes from you know who managed the Clash and the Subway Sect was a big influence Malcolm McLaren was a big influence on Bob Last yeah, yeah. and uh and I think, you know, Bob Last and, you know, Hilary Morrison, who was also vitally important in Fast Product, uh, they, they felt more like art movements, I think, rather than commercial the commercial music yeah. industry. I mean, it says in your book, like, when Fast started out, it didn't necessarily think it was starting out as a record label. It was almost starting out as something that was going to make sort of art statements in some sort of way, but it wasn't 100% decided what that would be. I think the first thing was a sticker or something. Yeah, they did some stickers, didn't they? they uh, criticising the festival. Uh, Scottish yeah, arts. Just kind of declaring some sort of intent and what they were opposed to, perhaps. Yeah, and, and again, that's another uh, aspect of Hillary's importance to the whole story of Scottish independent music was, you know, she bought... Bob Last, the uh, you know Spiral Scratch EP by Buzzcocks, which was on New Hormones, and New Hormones was a a big big influence. Even just that one record mm-hmm. really permeated right across all the bands and I think all the people that were running the labels. So she bought that 
a single uh, for Bob Last. And that was the moment Bob realised that, well, this is what fast products should be. We should start engaging with these intelligent uh, and crazy young people and mm -hmm. start making a noise. And there was something kind of a bit of a DIY ethos with something, uh, well, you had your postcard records which were like coloured in in Alan Horn's flat and wrapped around records mm -hmm. by the people actually making the records and their kind of extended family of friends mm -hmm. and fellow musicians. Where it felt like there was definitely, um, and that continued on to things like creation, where mm -hmm. it was like, you know, folding up the sleeves, the artists yeah. all sitting in Alan McGee's flat, folding them up themselves, putting up their own posters, designing and all that stuff. So the, the art, obviously was a big part of it. And I think for for me, people like, I find Andrew Logold much more interesting than I find any of the Rolling Stones. I find Malcolm McLaren more interesting than I find the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these figures, I, well, I think like uh, you were suggesting, Grant, I find some things much more interesting. Um, and, I, sure. and I think the Spiral Scratch one's in a very interesting one because if MD can you know if you don't know that record it's an amazing record but mm. it's also the way it was packaged it was one of the first records that i remember seeing and it was it just didn't look like gloss like mm -hmm. major label fair it looked mm. like something something different and something new and something almost that you could do yourself yeah i think there was a real encouragement from records like Spiral Scratch and I suppose the des Desperate Bicycles and Scritti Politti in their early phase on Rough Trade where it was imploring people, look, you can do this. You know, here's how, there's no, no mystery to it. Here's how much it costs to make a record. Here's how much studios cost. And that demystified the whole uh, idea of how you, you engage and put records out, I think. I think one of the other things that I really love in the book is... Uh, talking about the White Riot tour, which was a tour headlined by The Clash. But um, it's funny because there's the stuff that I knew but I'd never really clarified in my own head but made complete sense of how important that tour was to the, I guess, wave of Scottish musicians that I ended up be becoming part of and you became part mm -hmm. of, that the support ba bands... The Slits and Vic Goddard, mm -hmm. uh, primarily Vic Goddard and the Subway Set, almost were more important, I think, to Scottish bands, perhaps more so than the Sex Pistols or The Clash or any of the bands. There was a kind of ethos that it wasn't totally punk as we understood, or it wasn't punk rock. Mm -hmm. The Slits have always, for me, been almost, you know, one of the top five bands of that period. Yeah. It just... I've loved, and it was the first gig I got turned away for for looking too young. I was going to go and see them in Tiffany's in Glasgow when I reached the door. I'd walked into Glasgow to go and see them 12 miles and got sent home because wow. they weren't old enough to come in. First and only time it ever happened to me. But the Slits were um, an all female band. Um, later on, they had a, a male mm -hmm. drummer for a while, like, um, Budgie uh, joined them. But there's a really great bit in the book about almost like they seem like the first band that broke a golden rule. I was just wondering if you could maybe talk about that. Well, I think the idea of um, certainly you know, David Henderson from the Fire Engines before he formed the Fire Engines was in the audience at the, you know, the, the White Riot gig in Edinburgh on the 7th of May, 1977. And uh, the Slits came on stage and Ari... Ari Up was on stage and then she came into the audience and asked if she could borrow a comb. She started combing her hair in the audience. And certainly for Davey and I think for lots of other people, that was a big breakdown in the audience and artist barrier. Because prior to that, you know, it's Bowie's on the stage and he's a star and you want to go and see a star. This was a feeling of, you know, certainly for Davey, he was thinking, well, Ari Up's the same age as me. She She's was in the audience. The time, she was sixteen, which was incredible. So it was very inspiring, and it, uh, you know, I think also it's important to recognise um, when we're talking about the slits in the subway sect. How important John Peel was to that period, mm -hmm. because to my mind, the slits' best records by far were recorded for John Peel sessions in the early subway sect sessions, the early prefect sessions, the buzzcocks. You know, the recordings for Peel in many ways have never been bettered. They were sort of untamed. They were untamed. They were un... You know, they hadn't signed record deals. There was no producer trying to 
turning them from punk into new wave, you know. Something was, more saleable. Yeah, exactly. So it was so there's a raw beauty in those recordings which uh, were thankfully they were captured at that time because you know uh, as soon as the slits got a, a male drummer to me just I don't know. He could play his instrument too well. It I mean, I still bit, love those records, but I yeah, know what you're saying. It's a yeah. different thing. It's a different. It's a different band. It feels like to me. I much yeah. prefer the <clears throat> the four, early four piece. I think. I also think the Slits did address something at that time when uh, I was in my teens, uh, and it's a thing. It's much more topical now. The thing of kind of gender roles and gender roles in pop and rock, and. Um, th- the thing of the typical girls song that Slits have, which is, you know, one of their big records, mm. felt like a really important record because yeah. it spoke to a lot of women, but also it spoke to men or young uh, uh, boys in their teens who didn't feel like they were typical boys and didn't want to be typical boys. Yeah. Yeah. So there was also, you know, it wasn't about destroy. It wasn't about, you know, kind of, I guess, sloganeering in the same way to me. It, it almost felt like it was genuinely more and the records are genuinely more odd the recordings yeah and I think there's um, I mean that was a, one of the great successes of punk of, of which there were probably not that many to be honest but I think one of them was that idea that you know women weren't just the front person in a band you know um, and, it, and it became normal normalised you know initially um you know, female bands or female musicians in the the pre-punk era, it was totally sexist and, you know, just nonsense. And I mean, that that continued. I mean, let's not pretend it didn't. But I think when you had bands, uh, you female musicians, it just became normal. Nobody thinks anything if they see an, an all-female band anymore. And I think the Slits were pioneers in, in a you know, in that approach. And they didn't have any um, echoes of male rock mm-hmm. to me I think there are echoes of a kind of very male rock in some of the Sex Pistols stuff yeah but it's almost like if you hadn't heard the Slits before and you put on a Slits record you go what are the references here yeah that's it's that's completely it. they created their own sonic landscape that just was completely different and didn't follow kind of male rules yeah I mean the Sex Pistols was like you know they were, they were the New York Dolls really you know it was rock and roll and you know male rock and roll I think I think, you know, that's that was absolutely true. And I think probably another aspect of the Sex Pistols that was uh, their influence on the the Hungry Beat generation was probably the artwork was more important. I think yeah. you know Jamie Reed's artwork I think really connected with people, um, and you know the Pistols were great as a as a rock and roll cleansing device. But moving forward and creating something new, I think you are looking at the Slits. And the subway sect yeah. is, is really well. This is new, lyrically it's new, sonically it's new. I think for more than a generation of Scottish bands, and actually possibly generations of Scottish bands who don't even necessarily realise that they're very influenced by Vic Goddard and the subway sect, I think they're such a key band. And you know, when I listen to those early records, or when I listen to the other records that I feel are influenced by them. I just hear each other so many times. Uh, you know, like Orange Juice Records mm-hmm. could not have existed without the Subway set for me. And that's not taking in no way mm-hmm. from Orange Juice. And obviously Orange Juice went on to have hits and mm-hmm. be a big thing that they got in the Subway set didn't. But again, it was a kind of strange fit because that's almost like quite early doors still. And it's this punk rock bill. Mm-hmm. But you have the slits who don't really fit into the, 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 the kind of model. And Vic Goddard and the subway set definitely didn't fit mm-hmm. into it because it was almost like Vic Goddard didn't really like punk rock. <laughs> and so, yeah, and you've played with Vic quite a lot and built up a professional yeah. relationship with him, an artistic relationship. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of Vic Goddard. Because, again, Vic Goddard's not from Edinburgh. He's not from Glasgow. Mm-hmm. But I think he's one of the most important and influential factors in the alternative Scottish music scene. I totally agree. And I think Vic was the the central figure for both Fast Product and Postcard Records in terms of an influence. And, you know, one uh, anecdote that probably highlights that is when Grant had uh, 
uh, his film was uh, it was the the premiere in the the Edinburgh Film Festival <coughs> for Big Gold Dream, and afterwards there was an after party, and Vic Goddard and uh, myself and some other various Joseph K and Fire Engines members uh, performed a set of songs that were roughly related to uh, to the period that was been written about, and at the party after we'd played. Um, I was speaking to Bob Last and he was, um, he couldn't believe, he said, if you'd told me when I was releasing Fire Engines records that one day I'd be sitting here watching Vic Goddard sing Candy Skin with <laughs> Malcolm Ross and Russell from the Fire Engines, I would not have believed it. So, I mean, it really emphasised how central he was. I mean, I think it's more acknowledged he was a big influence on Orange Juice with them covering Holiday Hymn, mm. but with Fast Product as well, massive, massive influence. And I think all of the kind of Scottish musicians who followed the kind of bands who'd either been part of that fast scene or the postcard scene. You know, even if he didn't know it, as I say, you know, Norman and I both had Spiral Scratch. We mm. both had like early Vic Goddard <laughs> and Subbyset Records. So we were old enough, we were the right age to mm -hmm. be able, you know, be aware of that. But I think people who listen to Edwin's songs and James's songs in Orange Juice, and maybe we thought that was their year zero. Uh -huh. Didn't actually realise, well, it was actually... Yeah, that's where it came from. It was one removed. Well, there was a great interview um, in Grant's film with Vic and uh, down in Edwin's studio. And he was, he was you know, he's, he's a fantastic to interview, isn't he? <laughs> well, that was Eric who did that. But, um, no, I, absolutely, I've met Vic a few times in years, like a rock and tour. I don't think people will realise how funny he actually is mm. and how good a, an interviewee he is. Yeah, um, I mean, I've, I've got to interview him as well back in the day and, you know, and it's, yeah, it's, it's that strange one, which again, you were touching on, where in my day job at the BBC, I would be interviewing people who were really, really famous on a kind of mm -hmm. stage, not necessarily even always to my taste. Uh -huh. You know, so I'd be interviewing these like big international pop stars with number one records and TV stars and occasionally even film stars, and then I'd be interviewing Vic Goddard, kind of going home. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe. And at that time, I think Vic was working as a postman. Yeah, yeah. but to me, I, he was like, he's a giant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, completely. So yeah, in you know my day job, um, working in sort of other people as sort of films. You know, I've been lucky and worked with lots of you know, famous actors, but um, you know, it's just like. A day job, but it's like speaking to people like your know, Vic and yeah. your know, Norman as well. I remember getting really excited speaking mm -hmm. to to Norman Black. But yeah, so, you've, so you've got Brad Brad Pitt, who I'm sure is a people nice guy, and I know people have met him and said he is. But he's not. He's no Vic Goddard. No, yeah. exactly, exactly. I mean, Vic's almost like uh, to me. He's always halfway between an existentialist, like <laughs> oh, Albert Camus and uh, and Norman Wisdom. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I somewhere in the middle. <laughs> And it's interesting because I think so much of this, as I say, you're primarily a filmmaker and you write about music as well, really beautifully and full of passion. You know, okay. you're obviously, I think, like all of us, a fan who wants to share that passion, yeah. not, not keep it to yourself, but go, listen, everybody's these amazing things. But there's a real crossover for a lot of these artists in the importance of not just music, but actually being really aware of exciting artists in other fields. And I think. Sometimes I I get slightly worried when I meet people who want to be creative or see themselves as being creative, but we're not actually very interested in film or visual art or, or things like that. And um, this felt like it was an era where it, it, it was like the, the barriers between making music and making art, pop music and art, were, were definitely, they were thin. I mean, with... I mean, I definitely think they're, they're both like art movements. I mean, and I remember um, when Article 58 were in recording uh, our single uh, with Alan Horn and Malcolm Ross, Alan had the uh, Lubricate Your Living Room, a, you know, Fire Engines record, but it was before it was released. So Lubricate Your Living Room was released by the Fire Engines on a label called Accessories which was a sub-label of Paw Portal, which was a sub-label of Fast Product. And it was it was kind of like a remix album of an album that hadn't been recorded. Now, meta is an overused word these days, but it was absolutely 
I mean, I couldn't understand it. You know, Alan Horn was trying to explain to me what Bob Last was trying to do with that release. And it's like, you know, my gauche rural naivety was really kicking. I was like, I don't really understand this. I do now, of course. It's, well, I did quite quickly thereafter. But it was a brilliant idea. It's, it's it, taken you 40 years. 40 years <laughs> later, I've gone. But it was that idea. It was a brilliant idea. And I mean, that, you know, it was more of an art concept in the true sense of that term than a, than a rock and roll record. You couldn't really define it. Was it a remix? Was it a 12-inch single? Was it an album? No one really knew. And I think that mystery was something that the, the Fire Engines loved. And that's why they wanted to work with Bob Last. And they almost gave themselves over to Bob Last and just said, right, you package us however you want to use us. Use us. And, you know, a lot of bands, you know, disliking bands, Douglas, a lot of bands, the ego and very precious, they wouldn't give themselves over to another artist, Mm -hmm. particularly someone who runs a record label nominally, you know. Well, I guess... Yeah, the Velvets yeah. giving themselves over to Andy Warhol in quite a in quite a major way. Yeah, M- must have been something again that these pe- I can imagine the fire engines would be kind of. Oh yeah. Own. Well, if that was if that was okay for the Velvet Underground, we probably model ourselves more than the Velvet Underground than we might the Rolling Stones or the Beatles. Of all, mm-hmm. they both had. Well, the Rolling Stones certainly had a kind of strong yeah. artistic kind of. No, I think you're right. Yeah. I think um, I think the idea of having and Bob Last packaging and Hilary Morrison's photography, and you know, it, it was really telling. I think that they had such a deep interest in packaging consumerism. You know, it was related to a lot of uh, you know a lot of art theory, but but it was good. <laughs> it was art theory you could dance to. It was interesting, and it wasn't just for the sake of it. You know, they were making really important records. And you know, it mentions in the book the uh, you know the Gang of Four obviously had very uh, clear ideas about mm-hmm. how they wanted their single to uh, you know their single artwork to look, and they sent it all up to Bob, and he uh, Bob Last just turned it completely in its head and did the complete opposite, and by incorporated their letter, which explained how they wanted their artwork to look, so which the band hated. You know, I mean, we were talking to Bob recently and, uh, you know, it, it wasn't just like they didn't like it. I think uh, certain members of the band just didn't really talk to Bob again. Yeah, it, puts, it puts them in a vulnerable position that we don't... I think maybe also a lot of people in bands and things when they're certain age, the last thing they want is almost the thing that happens to the magician where the curtains pulled aside mm-hmm. and you discover it's all been a trick. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm not meaning it really was a trick, but they, they don't necessarily want to really reveal... A certain kind of vulnerable side or a planning side they wanted maybe to seem a bit more spontaneous and yeah and I think it was the process wasn't it, it was very much you know Bob was like um, I suppose stripping back the process there were you know a lot of like Brechtian ideas of well this is this is behind the screen and he was kind of showing that and it's you know most bands like the screen no, no, to uh, preserve the mystique. Absolutely. And I think got to realise here when you touched upon Spiral Scratch earlier, that was not like immediate records, but it was like an independent label. It was really just like a vanity label, like the Beatles, Apple label. They were distributed by the majors and Spiral Scratch was a fully 100% independently made and independently produced record and you know, that hadn't really been done before other than you know maybe some sort of like folk um, singer like advertising in like mail order so you know all this goings on with the record industry hadn't really been revealed to the public at all um, you know I think we're quite lucky seeing everything from a 40 year distance but for a band you know, all they knew was like Top of the Pops and appearing on Top of the Pops and to actually make a record yourself. That just seemed like insane. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how would you go about it? And that's why you know, I think the Desperate Bicycles records like fascinating and um, just what, what Bob was like trying to do. And, you know, like Hillary and you know, other people like the Desperate Bicycles were just trying to reveal that there is something mm-hmm. going on behind this. Um, I, I think it's fascinating. Well, moving on slightly, um, I want to talk about not just the book, but um, talk a little bit about your films. Obviously, we mentioned Big Gold Dream. The follow-up to that, 
which I think is really brilliant. <laughs> much better. Much better. <laughs> a film called Teenage Superstars, which I have to say, I'm in. <laughs> and uh, again, it's such a, a beautiful film. And one of the things that so many people talk about in that film, which again is slightly uh, aside, aside from the music, is it being a film about friendship and about the new friendship where everything is beautiful and where the friendships, people start to slightly fall out of love with each other and things like that. Was there a point where that, did that become a thing that you had almost as an agenda you wanted to be part of the film? Or was it something that just organically happened almost by accident? No, I think, you know, and... You know, we have a fantastic editor, Andrew Slavin, who, you know, massively has, like, you know, made the films with art. But, you know, to me, things that are interesting about music, you know, we could, like, just um, have a Wikipedia entry for, you know, any band, but it's, like, very sort of dry. And in biographies and autobiographies, I always think the most interesting things are just, like, that little bit of, like, excitement, you know, just before somebody is is famous and that's definitely part of it and you know it's just the excitement of people getting together and creating something I don't think that's like talked about and enough as I said you know you can be dry and have Wikipedia entries you know like we released this single and this is how we did it and this was our motivation behind it and this is our chord structure you know that's all great but um, it's the personalities that I think are important. It's the personalities that made the music that I wanted to get across. And Teenage Superstars is kind of the story of the generation of bands or some of the generation of bands that came in uh, Scottish alternative music after the Hungry Beat, Big Gold, Dream era. So it's bands like Primal Scream, Jesus and Mary Chain, The Pastels, Soup Dragons, Vaseline's, BMX Bandits. Shop assistant. Shop assistant. I'm, try, I'm trying to main, remember all the main ones so no one gets offended. Um, do you think, was there a difference between that generation of bands to the one that came, came I, before? I think there is. To, th there is. Um, to me, anyway, it'd be interesting to know what both of you think, you know, because I'm slightly removed from it. I think for the big gold dream era you know a, a big part of the the book is the selling in you know it's like infiltrating the mainstream and Bob Last like talks about they're, they're always looking like for cracks and I don't think at that time it was seen as anything like bad wanting to be on top of the pops I, I just mentioned that you know for the youth certainly for this um Big on Dream era, but people had only really known of pop stars being on top of the pops, and that was what everyone wanted to be. I don't think it had ever, the, the time hadn't come where it was seen as being maybe not, you know, sort of like dirty, but um, for ideological reasons. It, you know, later on, I think the, the teenage superstars like era had sort of like pushed against that, um, you know independent labels, you know, like creation, I think, were formed as like, a, you know, they later obviously became, you know, probably the most successful label. People like Oasis. It's like, ex exactly, yeah. And, you know, they seemed to like push against that. It was like, almost like, again, there'd been like another sort of like year zero movement because at the end of the Big Gold Dream film, you know, everybody was... As Douglas was mentioned, and yourself, you know, allowing people, you know, I, I think there's like a fine line between the fire engines allowing Bob in to do his you know, inverted commas manipulation and producing like fantastic, you know, products, but then when the fire engine successor band allowing like David Motion in mm. to put all his bells and whistles, you, know, you start becoming too manipulated. And it feels like the yeah, it almost became it? it almost felt like it was that thing in Animal Farm where the pigs exactly the yeah, absolutely become, yeah. become the same. So a lot of these bands almost became ultra commercial. And that's yeah. my criticism. It just, no, no, not at all. Almost like they had so, to yeah. go somewhere. I think there was a. I mean, the interest idea was absolutely there, and I suppose if you view it from the perspective of uh, you know a band like Orange Juice, they were probably the most renowned band. You know, after Poor Old Soul, which is the fourth single on Postcard, so they're on the front page of the NME 
there's can sell out tours, they're doing their peel sessions, they're still on the dole. So probably, you know, at that point, there's there's a, a fiscal reason for maybe signing to a major label. But there was also definitely that idea that we want to compete in the real charts, not the alternative charts. And that was absolutely a, a process. And I moved to Glasgow when I was 20 and... Um, I befriended the Jazzeteers who had been managed by Alan Horn. They weren't at that point, they'd signed to Rough Trade. And it was an attitude, they're, the Jazzeteers' attitude towards Rough Trade I found really hard to understand because it was very dismissive of Rough Trade. Very dismissive. I, I think I know where they got that dismissive mm-hmm. uh, approach towards Rough Trade. But they, they felt it was, um, they wanted to be on a major, which, you know, when they, 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 formed into Bourgeois Bourgeois again and they did sign to a major label. But there was there was something in the air with that generation of groups where it was, we don't want to be independent anymore, we want to be in the real charts, we want to sign to majors. And I mean it struck me that um they you know once they'd if you pardon the dreadful pun, accepted the the big gold dream of of signing to the major labels. They soon realised how sour it was and that commerce was a a nasty beast, mm-hmm. you know. And um and I know um uh, you know my my wife Katie was the singer in the fizz bombs, and it's when you mentioned the friendship thing. I think that was massive about that next generation, you know, of independent bands that that we, we spoke about there. Because, you know, like the people that formed the Fizz Bombs, Jesse Garan, Desperados and the shop assistants were all in the same class at college in Edinburgh. I mean, that's unbelievable. You know, surely, I mean, I can't remember in history a a college class that has, uh, you know, spawned so many bands. Mm. But the friendship thing was there that made that happen. But but, all these people started playing on all each other's records and things. Yeah, band. That's kind of similar to Bells Hill to an extent, you know. But I think there was definitely a thing with uh, with that generation. I don't know about yourself, Douglas, but there was definitely a feeling of, yeah, those bands used to be good, but then they all sold out. And I think that's why they became quite fiercely independent because they'd learned the lessons from that immediate generation before them that had, you know, taken the money and had their records diluted to slop in a lot yeah, of cases. Yeah, well, it's funny because at the time I remember a lot of bands when he went major. The first thing was when you heard the new records, you were like, he's a too slick. Now when I listen to a lot of their records, mm-hmm. I go, they sound great. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, a bit like you were talking about mm-hmm. the Slits, you mm-hmm. know, first proper album on yeah. Ireland, it felt like something, it was like a more pop version, yeah, more yeah. marketable version uh-huh, of what uh-huh. they'd been. Just to um, wrap up for now, um, yeah, end of day is looking for a present, not just for Christmas, for anything of the year, and you're interested in music, I cannot recommend this book, oh, and I cannot recommend Grant's films um, enough, because, uh, you know, I think they just really capture, they're like a time capsule, uh, you know, where you're allowed to go back into a world that was really, really important and really exciting to be part of as a fan or as a, an artist. So, yeah, please, you know, do consider it. And there's a, talk, there's a, there's a talking book version of this as well for Apparently. people. There yeah. is, but not um, voiced by the people in the film. It's voiced by actors. Wow! Yeah, it's it's quite well. It's like um, it's almost like a fast product release yeah. in itself. <laughs> if there's going to be one about uh, kind of the next era, uh, I'll try and think of who could play me. Um, <laughs> Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the things I wanted to wrap up with is just from both of you, uh, we're going to have a thing where we ask people to recommend <laughs> one particular thing, specific thing. Uh, you're a documentary filmmaker. Uh, Grant, and I know you're very passionate about a lot of other people's work. Um, if you to recommend one music documentary that you didn't make, that you feel everybody should see, that's a, what, an essential one, what would it be? Um, you've put me on the spot there, Douglas. I, I'm trying to think because I you know, watch music documentaries with a passion and I'm trying to think um, which one that I've seen recently. Um, I'll have a little think um, if you ask Douglas okay, this right. question. Okay. While, okay. while Grant's thinking and going through his life, <laughs> if I could just ask you for what album 
and single because I think it's singles okay. were incredibly important in it as well as albums. Which album and which single, if you could only listen to one as a gateway into the world of Hungry Beat, what should they put on? Okay, um, right. Well, again, to make sure I keep the the east and the west talking to each other, I'll start off the fast product record, which was Fast Eight, which was Scar's single, um, Adultery and Horror Show. The, I mean, it wasn't like a B-side. It was almost like two singles for the price of one. Uh, that was really the, the moment where it all came together for me. An incredible record. Still sounds amazing. Still sounds super exciting. So that would be my single. And then uh, going along the motorway to Glasgow, I, I would choose an album on Postcard, which is the only album released on Postcard, was Joseph K's album, The Only Fun in Town which uh, obviously a bit of a controversial gestation period because they scrapped their first album, Sorry for Laughing, and released a, went to record The Only Fun in Town in Belgium. A lot of people really hated it, like important journalists who'd been supportive of the band, like Dave McCulloch at Sounds and Paul Morley at the NME, uh, really slammed the album. And they were so influential at the time because they were big supporters. Uh, I think it's absolutely fantastic I think it really captures the live energy of Joseph K because they were always a better live band in, in the studio the good fortune with Article 58 of touring with Joseph K just when that album came out and they, they were incredible it was like the white light white heat velvets frenetic excitement amazing so that's my favourite album from that period. Okay, back to you, Grant. Uh, Lawrence of Algravia, which um, you know is a film that I know you have seen. It's a yeah. wonderful film about Lawrence from felt and denim and go kart motor. Was yeah. was that in the time? Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. It's in the film. Um, a fantastic film. I mean, um, I think he is one of the great, not just greatest musicians, but greatest artists of the kind of modern no product. completely like, Lawrence Lawrence Bograve it's an amazing film absolutely and you know a, a big part of I think all these books and like films and you know especially Lawrence is you know we call the film Teenage Superstars because these people are stars you know you don't necessarily have to have you know number one million selling record it's just like there's the type of person who um, is the characters and I think this book is like full of people like that you know Davy Henderson is mm -hmm. well, he's you know, an extreme guy. Yeah. He's like a superstar, but mm -hmm. um you know, he saw his last record sold one copy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. I know. But the one person he sold it to could be an important listener. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hopefully the book will go on to sell many more. I, I know it's already sold more than one copy. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming along today. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, great to talk those. to you guys. It's always a pleasure. Never a chore when I meet you guys. Yeah, Likewise. Hungry Beat, um, as I say, I, I think it's a great book and I look forward to, will there be a follow-up? There might well be. You'll we'll see. Yeah. Be in it. <laughs> You'll be <in> it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds like an even better book. Okay, well, thanks very much, guys. It's good to see you. Okay, thanks. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, this is um, pretty excitement. We've got two Douglases for the price of one here, and we're going to do um, a song by a guy called James Kirk, who first, I guess, uh, gained fame from being one of the two writers in early Orange Juice Records. And then he, he went he went solo. Uh, well, he had a band called Memphis, and then he, he went solo. And we were talking about Vic Goddard, and I think this song has got a big Vic Goddard influence to it. And um, it's a little bit seasonal, but you can enjoy it at any time of year, I would say. This is called Apri Ski, written by Mr James Kirk, originally recorded by Memphis. <laughs> Bonnet, reindeers danced upon it like diamonds before my eyes. As we lifted to the summit, my heart began to plummet as I began to realize you were leading me on. But we go every ski, take it from me. We'll be very happy as we 
go higher and higher you realize I'm leading you on later at the party all are hail and hearty all have tired eyes none have fires brighter or hearts any lighter than the one who's by my side you are just leading me on as we go at risky take it from me we will be very happy as we go higher and higher and you realize I'm leading you on I look into the fire's glow the senses hiding by the snow slippers dancing on the open toe they set my heart aglow as we go Take it from me, we will be very happy as we go higher and higher, and you realize I'm leading you on. As we go at risky, take it from me, we will be very happy as we go higher and higher. I think that last note almost worked. It did, definitely worked. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Douglas.